Today on Media Lair Sandwich, we're at PinguaCon with their guest of honor, and he's talking about... What, what are you talking about? Time detaching from my brain. And books, and television shows. And a little and t- stood bit on Twilight. Oh, look, there's, there's way more Twilight conversation in this than I expected. But it's great, because it's terrible. <laughs> Welcome, we are recording an episode of Media Litter Sandwich. We are at PinguaCon. So the people that are watching this actually know why I said what they're watching, because I hope they would already know, or listening to. I'm Toad from Toadin.com and YouTube.com slash K. With me is William from AllAboutWilliam.com. And since we're at PinguaCon, we asked for one of their guests of honors to interview, and so they roped somebody into this. So, first off, my apologies. Oh, I'm so down for this. I love it. I actually love that I am fully unprepared because that's basically my tagline on the internet. So, I feel like it's, it's thematically appropriate. <laughs> cool. Okay, so, since you probably don't know, we're a podcast that are from media creators. Uh, William's a photographer. I'm a videographer. One of our other hosts has done public access TV and music and a ton of stuff. Um, but he's not here right now, so we're not going to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> and operating our camera is B from Third Hand B14, who streams on Mixer, and he helps me out at these cons, which we're always uh, very thankful for, even though he's not in front of the camera, um, as he gives me a dirty look for this. <laughs> <laughs> So what we talk about is not just creating media, but Mm -hmm. the world around it. Right. You know, and you definitely see that. Yeah, I do. Uh, You want to tell us a little bit about it, or you want me to go ahead and try to do my best and probably butcher everything you do? it's, It's interesting, too, because I think we're in this weird, beautiful stage of, like, uh, media production where people have jobs that literally did not exist a decade ago. Um, and I run into this problem all the time, too, because, you know, I'm now getting into publishing fiction for the first time. And that's very easy to explain. I wrote a book. It came out the end. Uh, but what I've been doing since 2009 um, is I, I run what's called the Mark Does Stuff universe in which I read books and watch television shows unspoiled. I'm never allowed to research what I'm, I'm, I'm reading or watching. And then I film myself while doing so. So um, it's somewhat related to like the Let's Play videos that have been cropping up with video games, except it's books and and TV shows. Um, And I've been doing it for, it'll be nine years this August. I don't know how that's possible that I've turned this into a career. This is what I do for a living. Um, And so that's what I meant about like, I'm unprepared for everything because people, my my community votes on whatever I'm going to read or watch next. And they tend to find the most plot twisty, devastating thing imaginable just so they can watch my reaction to right. those things that also destroyed them. Um, it's a, I mean, I basically read books and watch TV for a living. It's pretty sweet. Um, but it's, I, like, it's, it's in media, that's not a thing we had, like, at all. Right. I never, when I was a kid, this is never something I thought I would do in my life. <laughs> but here I am. Yeah, and the, fu- the, the big change is back when we were growing up, even mm-hmm. 10, 15 years ago, you know, you watch a TV show and it's this whole new world and oh, in this universe, it's like this. Today, we want relatability. Yeah, we do. Um, oh, and it's, it's, it, it's interesting too, and I'm, I'm curious to hear from both of you about this as well, is like, I feel we care more about the people behind the camera, behind the book, behind the music than we did before. I mean, growing up for me, it was all rocks. Everyone was a rock star. Everyone was a movie star. These authors were these unreachable people that I never knew anything about. They were all very, very mysterious. Mm -hmm. Whereas I have people who have literally corrected my own bio to my face, and they were right. And it's like, (laughs) that's such a weird phenomenon that there are people on the internet who know more about me than I know about myself. Like, because we're in this age now where, like, being very personal and being Mm -hmm. very relatable is kind of what we're looking for. We're looking to make those connections across time and space that that I think a lot of us were, I mean, put in very direct and very thirsty for. We want them, so. Yeah, it's like, hey, you said you graduated from this university (laughs) in this year, but... (laughs) When I did my research, because I go to that university, I was curious. Yeah. It turns out that you actually had one more year. You only walked, and then you did one more class or, or paper. What yep. was that about? <laughs> yep. Oh, I, I guess you're right. But it's because they wanted to relate. Right. It, it is. 
How big of a compliment is that? Or is that, or is that just I mean, what it is? Part of, the, part of the problem is that I'm a very prolific media producer. Um, I did a count a couple weeks ago because I, my publisher wanted to know. They're like, how many pieces of nonfiction work do you have currently posted on the internet? Because I don't link to everything all the time. I have these blogs or these huge like backlogs of everything I've ever read and watched for the last nine years. And I'm up to something like 7,500 essays in the last nine years. Um, and so I've said a lot of things that I didn't remember that I said, mm -hmm. um, where I like talked, you know, in this specific example, someone corrected uh, when I was a uh, two years old, I got, or it was before I was two, I got adopted out of foster care and I lived in Boise, Idaho for this tiny little period. And I was doing like a live chat thing on, I think either on my website or Reddit. And someone was like, tell us more about being in Idaho. And I was like, oh, I was there until 1993 when I moved. And then someone commented, they're like, mm, didn't you move in March 1992? And I was like, so immediately I was like, this is not a compliment at all. This is terrifying. And I was like, how would you know that? You're right, but how would you know that? And they're like, oh, you said it in this review here. And I was like, oh, like, okay, that's not your fault. So it was flattering that they're like, oh, I remembered this detail about your life and I find you interesting enough that it stayed in my head. So it, it ended up being a compliment. It, initially I was like, I feel like I'm in danger. This is terrifying. Did this um, dude know somebody that works for something. Right? <laughs> and how? And how do I get access to that thing? But it's... It's flattering when people pay attention to you and it seems genuine, if that makes sense. Right. right. Like when it feels like they're actually interested in who you are as a person, I think that, that attention is always complimentary to me. Very cool. Because I could see cool. being defensive at first, like, wh why <laughs> do you know that? What are you doing? Yeah. I don't under. Then you realize they're just a fan and, yeah. <laughs> and they just want to correct or see what's up. That's. And that's awesome. I mean, I'm a horrible speller, and sometimes I put up stuff very, very fast. And for someone to correct me, at first it's like, oh, now I got to change it, and this side, and this side, and, and, and over here, and then I got to check my notes, see where I wrote over here. And the other, But I'd rather be right than wrong. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes there are things in the balance. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, changing one word could mean the difference between... Um, it could mean it could just be the difference between people going, okay, I understand what they meant there, versus uh, a sponsor going, yeah, we don't like that word, or a guest, because this actually happened to on my channel where I interviewed somebody and I used a term that they are no longer associated with, or they did not want to associate themselves with right. anymore. They used to be, but no longer, and right. they and one of their, um, you know, one of their affiliates reached out to me and said, hey. If you take this word out of your tags and out of your description, we will promote you. Yeah. We will promote your podcast. Yeah. Yes, we're going to take that out. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Let me do that right now for you. <laughs> yeah. It's better than if they didn't say something. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Oh, come on, William. I know I you. I never know. have questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, you know, you have your, all your independent stuff mm -hmm. and then you have all these reviews. How yeah. do they intermix? Um, I mean, I, I started this whole thing as a hobby. It was, actually, it wasn't even a hobby. Let me back up. It was a bet. Um, a bet. It was a bet. I had an editor when I was living in Los Angeles. Basically, he, he bet that I couldn't read the Twilight series <laughs> and make it through it. And it was just this shitty joke he made. How much um, money did he win? Um, well, he didn't win any money because he lost um, and inadvertently started my whole career. And I don't even know that he knows that he did this. Uh, I suspect he probably, when he sees my stuff, because we're still friends on Facebook, but um, I mean, in the end, technically I won because I got a, a, I could live off of it. So I feel like that makes me the winner. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it was a bet that turned into this internet like viral sensation that became a hobby. And then I moved from Los Angeles to Oakland and I had a full-time job. And then I got laid off from that job and I turned the hobby into my job out of dis desperation because I needed to do some, this thing I'd been doing that was just a little silly joke was getting bigger and bigger and bigger and taking up so much of my time that I was like, I wonder if I can have it take up my full time and make it a thing out of that. So I've been doing it as a job, you know, since 2000, yeah, January 2012. And so that, that element of it means that even up to this day, that's sort of my, my, I consider it my day job. Like that's the thing. And I take it very seriously. Right. I mean, it is an, an it's an independent, um, business technically um i have an assistant i have volunteer moderators that help with community stuff and with like little bits of editing here and there um 
but you know it's it's I don't treat it like a joke. I have fun with it. I have so much fun with it because I just get to make terrible jokes on the internet all the time or yell or cry on camera. Like, like comparatively for other people's jobs, I'm living my dream. At the same time, I like don't ever, I don't ever want to take advantage of the fact that I get to do this because a lot of people don't get to do it. And I think that's right. pretty cool. So like, and I imagine you probably do the same thing. Like there, you can have fun, but then still be respectful of the fact that this is a thing that people listen to. I want it to be high quality. I want people to, to you know, like, so that's why I'm so prolific is, is I didn't want to have this thing set up where you only get like one post a week. Like, and I, I have a post go up every single day, five days a week. Oh, and it's a lot of work. It's a yeah. lot of work, but I like that consistency and I like rewarding the people who have chosen to support me either through Patreon or through my videos or, or coming to the website and commenting. I like the sense of this like community that always has a momentum. I'm watching one thing and then moving on to another and then reading this book and then moving on to the next book in the series. And instead of this project that just starts and ends and then it's never, there's nothing else beyond it. Mine is always sort of moving. So, I mean, I guess that's how I think of how I think of it. Okay. How do you keep this energy up? <laughs> uh, I mean, five different content a week at minimum. Times I'd two. Say. Times two. Because there's a, I have a book site and a TV site. Right. So it's actually 10. So 10 reviews a week. So it's with a that video uh, version and then and you then, have it written out. So, well, the video version is basically the raw immediate reaction. Okay. And which I really love because that's also a form of film or book criticism is your what is your immediate reaction to plot twist character development you know visuals if it's television like what your immediate reaction often t says a lot about yourself and a lot about the thing that was produced the written part is sort of like me then processing it so a lot of times i'll say something in a video and then i'll get to the review part of it where i'm, I'm writing it down and i'm like mm, actually i don't really like this thing i don't think it's as funny as i thought it was like you know or or it's me just expanding on why this thing made me so emotional or why this thing scared the shit out of me or you know and telling stories from my life or whatnot so you know those are the two components um as in terms of energy the va vast majority of it comes from how fun it is like i just get to watch tv I sit on my couch and I watch TV for a job. I sit on my couch and I read books for a job. Like it's it's the only element element of it that's like energy draining is the actual physical reading um, can be pretty draining at times. Yeah, it's I hard try to... to do some book reviews and it was just just to try something yeah, different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so a couple publishing companies would send me some books that they just wanted some promotions and they were never any good books. Yeah. And they also weren't meant for my demographic anyway. Yes. They were usually meant for four, uh, 14 year olds uh, uh, that were into the whole retelling of fairy tale graphics. Yeah. I had re Wait, read like, sounds like four or five. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm like, wait, give me those books. I kind of. <laughs> Oh, but man. it's hard, right? It's it's it is a challenge. I'm not going to lie and say mm -hmm. it's not, or that it's not physically draining at times. Um, every once, I, for the most part, what's been really neat about it is that over the years, people have figured out what my taste is and the things that they know I'll react to. So they anticipate that, and so they're recommending things. They're recommending me things knowing there's either one element in it or the whole show that'll just ruin my life. So I'll give you a good example is, and I didn't know, initially know why people recommended this, but for about two or three years, everyone on the planet was like, why aren't you watching Person of Interest? And I was like, I don't know, I don't really want to watch. I don't know, it didn't, I didn't really know what it was. Mm -hmm. um, and because I can't research it, I couldn't go out and be like, okay, that sounds like my thing. But people just kept pitching me like, it's a show, it's not what you think it is. As long as you get past the first season, like it's, I think it's your thing. Um, and so I finally got to it last year and it was my thing one episode in, by the way. I don't know why they were all like, you gotta wait the whole first season. But it was so fulfilling because I went into it just knowing that people wanted me to watch it and not knowing why. And then as I watched it and the show vast, became vastly different than what it had, it had been uh, pitched as to me, even in the pilot, I was, it was such an interesting experience for me. Um, and so it, it's very rare that I watch or read something that I actually dislike. And if you're reading or watching something you dislike, you get much more tired easily. Mm -hmm. You get more annoyed easily. So, like, I don't have that. I love being annoyed, though. <laughs> I, I love being annoyed because what I'm doing when I'm reading or watching something I dislike, why don't I like this? 
Yeah, I agree. That's the thing people forget to do. It's not, oh, this, I don't like this, this sucks, whatever, turn it off. No, why don't you like yeah. it? Yeah. That you can learn so much more from. Oh, you can't. And I mean, it's funny that you say that because where I started was Twilight, which I fucking hated. <laughs> hated, like viscerally hated so much. And it was this. Did you start I, with the book or the movie? Oh, I did all four books okay. in order. And I've only seen the f first movie. The, like, I have people who are like, I will pay you thousands of dollars to sit and watch you watch New Moon. Like, I just want to watch your face <laughs> as your soul evaporates from your body. I have watching got the to worst. find those. Yeah. So, those videos. Yeah. Um, so with Twilight, it was this thing where, where I mean, and the, the way the bet worked is I was at Comic-Con in 2000, mm -hmm. summer 2009, and the my editor told me, you have to cover the, the Twilight New Moon panel in order to go to Comic-Con. You can do whatever you else you want for your coverage and your photography stuff, but you have to go to this one thing. And I told him, fuck you, that's terrible. No, I don't want to do it. And he basically was like, you're turning down this opportunity to go to this huge convention for free, mind you, because of one hour. And I was like, all right, I'll do it. Like, And it ended up being this really strange experience. That was the first year that people lined up at Comic-Con days before a panel started. So now it's a thing that they wow. plan for, and they put like these big tents outside because they know people will line up for Hall H, which is this, like, ele I believe it's 12, maybe 13,000 people fit in one room. And it's where all the big major, like the Marvel stuff happens right. there. Like, so I'm, I'm just going to wait the day until the footage gets leaked. Well, <laughs> it's this I get it's this experience because if you are in line early, you get to be feet from these people you admire and adore. So I was there in line from at like five in the morning on the day of the Twilight panel, surrounded by Twilight fans and listening to them talk about how this is the greatest series ever written. And I had this moment have you ever had this moment where you hear someone talking about a show or a book and they they're talking about it and you're like, Oh, maybe I got this wrong. Maybe it is actually good and because I was biased against it. I'm just thinking negative things. Um, you, by the way, you should listen to that because I did not listen to that. And and so when I got back from LA and I'd done a, a piece on the people standing in line instead of the, the panel itself. Oh, that's totally And it did awkward. really well. And, and my editor just made this comment. He was like, it'd be really neat. I bet you couldn't read Twilight and write about it. And so I actually started it like a few days later as a joke in the office. But I, I tried to give it a good go and be like, okay, look, it's young adult fiction. I know how young adult fiction works. I've read so much of it. There are certain tropes that I love and I don't care. And I think I got like five chapters in and I was like, this is badly edited. I don't understand why any of this matters. This main character does not know how to make decisions. Mm -hmm. And by the and here's the thing. I literally passed it around the office. It would get like 10 views a day. Like nothing. Just nothing on internet terms. And then like the internet found it halfway through the first book. And I had like 10,000 views a day at the end of the first book. And my editor was like, this is doing really well on our website. Now you can't stop. <laughs> um, and I ended up reading all four. No pressure four, there. Yeah, no pressure at all. I ended up reading all four books. And I think I liked like two things out of everything in the series. Alice? Uh, yeah, what's that? Alice. Alice was pretty cool. I was like into one of Jacob's brothers. Like, but I think it was purely because in my head he was hotter than he was on the page. So I was like, this is pretty cool. Um, yeah, Alice was pretty neat, except for even then, oh, we can't do this. I can't actually okay. get into Twilight Discourse. <laughs> the point, you, there's this mistaken belief that, like, of who is allowed to be a fan and what the things that they're talking about. But, like, when you're talking to people who are super passionate about something that they mm -hmm. love, it's infectious. And I think that was something that I initially didn't capture. And I kind of want, like, it was fun snarking on a book and yelling at it, mostly in all caps. I used a lot of capital letters in these things. <laughs> but, I, in, and how this, because the thing is, is even then, I, it was just going to be a one-off project. I didn't want to keep doing it. But I had a friend who was like, I think this would be neat if you did this with something you ended up liking. Um, and the second thing I covered, and somehow I was, what, 20... I don't know. I don't know how numbers work. Tw almost. Tw I was 25 years old when this started. If he's I, wrong, feel free to correct in the oh, comments. Oh Jesus Christ! No, that's <laughs> horrible. Don't do that. Please do that. Um, um, I had at 25 years old. I had never read Harry Potter, and I had never seen any of the movies. And I w I felt like I was the only person on the planet who hadn't. So I had a, an office mate who was like, "I really like you yelling at Twilight, but I think you would like Harry Potter. You should do Harry Potter next." Um, and one of the things that was really cool about that experience was. 
I had always thought that Harry Potter fans were like too intense and weird. But then once I started reading the book and then talking to a lot of them, was that experience of like, man, they have some really interesting things to say about the world. And yes, mm-hmm. on the surface, you may think that they're these like really, really obsessed, like way too obsessed people. But like, aren't a lot of us like, like get me talking about the X-Files. I grew up with the X-Files. Mm-hmm. That is the thing that I just get horrible about. Like if you're like around me and you're like, mm, I don't know if I like Dana Scully, I will like put a knife up to your throat and be like, I'm gonna murder you right now. Like I have things that I get like super defensive about, which is not a good thing to be, but like. But it's really fun for it those is of us that fun. troll sometimes. It's super Who's people- your favorite character at Harry Potter? Who's your favorite character? Why do I have to choose from my babies? Uh, my fa- my um, Top five. I'm totally gonna no no no. Troll I can do one. Whatever I can do you're one. gonna say, I'm gonna troll you. I'm gonna tell you that right now. I mean, I, uh, she's in the top. Luna's in the top five because I love weird characters. <coughs> yes. Like I love characters okay. who exist outside. And like ah. Luna's, she's so her weirdness is normal to her, and I love that she just t- can't conceive of herself being weird. She's just. Mm-hmm. But I gotta go with my daddy Hagrid because oh, I awesome. hated, I didn't like Harry Potter at first. Okay. And it wasn't until he showed up that I was like, oh, this is not the series I thought it was. And I think it was because, like, especially in young adult fiction, mm-hmm. you often don't have an authority figure, like an adult, who is awesome very early in a series. They're usually the villains <laughs> or they're not there at all. And immediately I was like, oh, wait, he has a positive male figure who by the way arrives on a in, in a leather jacket on a fucking motorcycle out of the sky like i was like this is like a judas priest music video i'm so into this like and i've just had this thing where i just I always loved... went to meatloaf music video <laughs> like Bam! oh yeah yeah oh he's way more meatloaf than judas priest oh my god <laughs> And what was really cool about the Hagrid... We I like how you said his as mind as on the podcast. You said you were going to troll me, and you did, <laughs> except you broke me. <laughs> this is totally meatloaf. Oh, my God. Because he's got that irreverent sense of humor, yep. and he's like... But he's still like... Oh, the hair. Like, but, like, he still takes himself serious. Oh, this is too... I hate, I hate this. <laughs> well, uh, the really cool thing about Hagrid is he also bridges between the wizarding world... And the human world, which it, again know, goes back to the relatability. I did not plan to, for this for this to be all about relatability, but but it is. That's why I ended up liking it more than Twilight, because in the end I could relate to those stories, and not all of them. Like there's some weird shit in Harry Potter, but like <laughs> there there was so much more in it that even yeah. as someone in their mid twenties, I was like, oh my god, I related to this so much. I mean, and I tell this to people all the time because I I know a lot of people. Here's the thing, like when I was doing it, I also had no real idea how fandom reacted to the books in real time. So I never had a sense that if I had a certain opinion, it would be like controversial. Um, and so one of them was that I really liked Order of the Phoenix, and everyone hates that book. Not everyone. Now I learned that like lots more people like it, but like at the time, everyone was like, We're really surprised you like this book. Why do you like this book? Harry is so hard to get through, and I was like, Because I. I literally write in all caps all the times, first of all. And he <laughs> screams in all caps throughout the book. But I just really liked that there was this kid dealing with trauma and anxiety, and it was just right there on the page. And I related to it so much. Um, mm-hmm. And that's the thing with, like, with, with media that's so interesting is sometimes someone will write something or, or create something, and you have that sense that they reached through time and just grabbed your story and put it up there. And it is just this transformative, amazing thing that only happens every so often. But when it does, like it's that's your thing, and that becomes your jam, yeah. and you're just like, wow, I connected to this in a way where I'd never connected with something else. It's interesting that you say taking something and putting it up there for other people. Yeah. Because that's kind of what you do uh, when it comes to reviewing and reaction. And mm-hmm. now today, we actually have two books, um, for video versions, different than the audio version, uh, in front of you. And they are not your own books. No, I got gifted these on the last panel by my friend who works for Subterranean Press. Um, I have read some of Elliot de Bedard's uh, work before um, and Charlie Jane Anders. Um, but it's this thing now where like, I still uh, – I actually had to put up a thing on my like FAQ on my website um, – um, like, please stop giving me books and DVDs at tour events. Because it was this thing where, like, people right. love my reactions so much that they just gift me things. And then they're like, okay, when are you going to watch or read this? And I'm like, 
Oh, no, 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 no. I don't have... My whole schedule's planned out for like a year ahead. I don't have any time to do any of this stuff. I'm um, too busy it's... planning on how I'm going to ship these back home. Yeah. Well, not these. These are very small, so I'm very excited. And I needed reading on the plane home, so I was like, this is a great gift. Um, but, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's such an interesting thing because I'm, like, known... There, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna make this real funny. I lit- there is literally a blog on the internet called Mark Reacts that is just a collection of gifts of my face. <laughs> I, I actually found that site researching yeah, this morning. It's wild. Um, and my friend Kelsey runs it, and and like that's like it's so weird to think that when you're doing media, like especially nonfiction stuff or like transformative work stuff, and you get a fandom based on you because again I like when I was a kid this is not something I ever could have imagined but I've managed over the years that I like literally have fans of me and that's such a weird concept and and now that I'm doing fiction and I have a book coming out um in like oh my god in like 17 days that's so weird um and now I'm seeing people you know like follow me on Twitter and talk to me about and they have no idea I ever did all the stuff for the last decade and they're fans only of the book and now in my brain is like, I can't handle this. That is so weird to me. Because when I was a kid, I always wanted to be a writer. And so I just assumed if that ever happened, I, that's the normal type of fans. So I had to like rethink what a fan is over the last decade because you can, we now have fans of just people and the things they say and do on the internet. And that's, that's our lives. Like, yeah. Let, let's talk about your book for, for a bit. Since oh it's coming god. out, let's talk about it. Oh my it. god. Well, um, what's the title of it? Um, so I have a book coming out with Tortine um, called Anger is a Gift. It's a young adult contemporary book uh, that has become unbelievably weirdly relevant. And I did not plan for this, but it's about a bunch of kids learning how to stage a walkout at their high school. Uh, oh. And this, I started writing this in 2012. It took about five and a half years to get to publication. Um, and and when, when I say that, I mean it didn't take five and a half years to write the book. It took like a year and a half for the first draft and then multiple drafts and then two years to find an agent. And then once I get an agent, it sold in 23 days, which once once this shit happens, it goes so fast. Um, I got what is called crashed, which is when a publisher does not take like two years to publish your book. I got my book deal in February 2017. I got my editorial letter two months. I turned it around in four and a half days. Um, And so it's so weird because I'm used to the media stuff you do now, like you're going to do this podcast and you're going to edit it at, at most your, this whole process is what, like a month, maybe. I don't know how quick you're less than that. We're, we're, I'll probably have this done editing. I spend two days, three days on it. And then it sits until, uh, it's a proper date that I have it scheduled. Yeah. And I'm used to, and for me, it's, I write a, I sit down, I watch something, uh, I process the video and it does all the encoding stuff so it can either go on in my store or on YouTube. Then I sit and I'll take anywhere from 45 minutes to two hours to write a single review. I'll schedule it. It'll come out anywhere from 10 to seven days in advance. That is my whole timeline of posting a review. And then I just move on to the next one and I do that. And and so getting into publishing has been really weird because everything is stretched out so long. Um, uh, but it's... It's been really cool because that's what I always wanted to do. I just took a weird, windy, roundabout path to get to publishing a book. Um, but I'm glad I took that path. So, um, yeah, it's – it's I'm I'm very excited about it. Uh, it's been – it's surreal. It's very surreal when you want – like, this is literally my sole bucket list item in my life is publishing a book. It's happening in like, oh, now I'm getting like kind of emotional. It's happening in like 17 days. And I, I literally cannot fathom it. It doesn't make sense to me. It still feels like a fear dream that I'm imagining it and that something's just going to swoop in and be like, psych, didn't really happen, which better not fucking happen. I did so much work on this book. But um, yeah. And, <laughs> and then, then I have party. another book coming out in a year, uh, which I like barely sort of talking about because it's kind of slightly a secret. But um, it's it's been interesting to get to to do media production, but in a different venue, especially when there's so many other people working on it. Right. Because I imagine wow. you're editing the video, the these yes. yourself. Yeah, I'm used to one pass of edits, which is me on a review. <laughs> I just read it over once, which means there's always a lot of spelling errors because I'm the same way. I type very fast and there's just, sometimes they're really unfortunate. unfortunate. I remember once when I was reading The Hunger Games, uh, I didn't realize that my autocorrect had corrected the word clock into cock. <laughs> 
<laughs> and for about 10 reviews in a row, there's like, if you've ever read the second Hunger Games book, a clock is very important to that story. Yeah, all those reviews say cock. It's super <laughs> awkward. No one told me until they were done, by the way. They were like, let's just let it keep going until he notices. I didn't notice at all. So, um, so I went... Yeah, I mean, I feel like it improved the Hunger Games greatly. Um, but it's this. So, thing. what time is it again? Yeah, what time right. Are we ending. <laughs> oh five my god. Or what? Um, I think it's interesting too because I'm like you. It's when you're an independent producer, so much of it is just yourself. You're one person making the episodes, coming up, you know, or doing the research, doing yes. the all of these things you do by yourself, and then you get to publishing where I turned the manuscript in and then there was my main editor and then there were three copy editors and then four sensitivity readers. Then there's the marketing team. Then there's the, uh, um, the, the publicist. There's all these different things and they all have little bits and pieces that affect everything that you do. Um, and I'd always heard that publishing was like a team effort and I didn't understand it until I went through it. And it's very, it's strange. It's strange for someone to take your work and then ask you to make it different. Um, and I, it, it wasn't that I resisted. I did journalism in high school and college, so I was used to being edited. But it's still weird, after spending nearly a decade, this being mostly a one-man show, and now it's like 70 people worked mm -hmm. on one book. And I, I, you know, until I went through it, I didn't really understand how weird and strange that experience is. I'm going to go ahead and open this up to questions. Uh, the only thing I ask you guys to do is to actually walk up to the microphone. Unless you do not want to be on video, you don't have to do. You don't have to be on video if you don't want to. If you don't want to, you can just shout your question from your seat, and then we will repeat the question. Um, but I'll go ahead and open it up so the microphone is open over here. Going once. Go ahead, Blue. Um, well, I was gonna say first off, uh, with Twilight, if you do watch the movies, <laughs> oh, definitely watch Eclipse. Um, oh. I saw it. I thought it was great. Pay no attention to the fact that I was sick and very high on cough medicine at the time. But, well, see, this is one of those. That's a ringing endorsement, by the yes. way. <laughs> ringing endorsement. I was high. Enjoyed it was great. It. I'm like, it wow, was, I'm in. Yeah, great. I love one of those out. hangover movies. Just remember to be yeah. high and drunk at the time. Well, <laughs> it's, but it's even better when you're sober because then you get to watch this thing and, and have that moment of, what part of this did the high person enjoy? Like, and then you see it, and then there's like, I don't know, I'm, I'm super into this. It's gonna happen someday, I'm, I promise. Now you have to go and watch it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, my actual question is, you've described so much of your process and everything, yeah. you know, like all the things you do on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. How do you find the time and energy to keep up on it? Is it, is oh, it man. purely I mean, driving force, or is it just? Oh, man. Okay, so two answers to that question. One, I'm literally on a panel about six that is that topic, which oh. is how do writers, how do you, how do prolific writers do what they do? And it's like I'll me. I'll see you there. Yeah, it's great. And I'll, I, but I'm going to actually answer your question because there's a lot of what I do that isn't writing at all. Um, I will say that a healthy motivator is, hey, this is my job. I need to make money. And I have found that that motivates me about 75% of the time where I'm like, yep. I don't have a choice. I have to get this done. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the other thing for me is it's about setting up habits. So um, I have this thing with my group of friends in New York and well, and elsewhere too, because I have a lot of friends around the country where um, I tell them, they all know, Monday and Tuesday, I do not exist. Don't text me. Don't expect me to get back to you about anything unless your baby's on fire. Well, that's terrible. That, I mean, yeah. if your baby's on fire, please don't call me. I can't do anything right. about it. But, you know, like, like unless it is, like, the highest of emergency, because Monday and Tuesday are – Monday is my, my, my TV day. Tuesday is my reading day. That is the day I do nothing. I socialize with no one, and I give it Who's to myself. Like? like, that's my day to get these things done where I need to record videos – um, you does, know, does that stick? Because I find myself and I tell people that those are the days they hit me up. Nope. Oh, it they, does. They, they it's me, great. I just don't answer the, the phone. I, yeah. I have the same thing. Monday, Tuesday. Yeah. Don't talk because yep. it's yep. not that they remember that you said, don't call me on these days. They remember these days. Yep. yep. That's what they remember. And if that's the case, it's a general reminder. I'll just be like, I literally just say it's video day. And they're like, good. I'm good. I remember now. <laughs> um, and so I have that element of the, of the habit. Um, and so, you know, uh, I have, like, my desk is where I write my reviews. I have uh, Sunday night is when I do my grocery shopping so that I have all the snacks. So I don't have that thing of, like, I don't have anything here to eat. I don't know what I want. Everything, it's, like, it's all about, like, figuring out, like, 
what is your flow? And for me, my flow is I get up real early on Mondays and Tuesdays, like six, seven in the morning, okay. even though I don't have to go into an office and I start real early. I get started because I know even if I sleep late, by the time I get to the end of the day, I'm going to be so tired. I don't want to write a review. I don't want to record anything. So I have this thing where I get up real early on Mondays and Tuesdays, and then I don't allow myself to work past 8 p.m. Because the other thing is, is I need to give my brain a break. I need to give my body a break because reading... Reading aloud for like half an hour is super draining. Yeah. So I, I have these certain things that are like, this is what allows me to stay on schedule. If I do happen to have writer's block, um, it's a little more difficult because it's not like I can just move on to the next episode. I need to finish that review before I can start the next one. So I have little things that I do to just jog my brain. Usually it's stand up, don't look at this for like five to 10 minutes, go walk outside, walk down to the end of the block and back. Do something that has nothing to do with writing, nothing to do with recording, <laughs> nothing to do with editing. Kind of detox just, a little. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and it's a way to get out. my brain to think about something else. Usually I'm playing games on my phone. Um, <laughs> I do, and I give myself those moments so that I don't have this feeling of I have worked for 14 hours straight with no break. Instead, it's I've worked two hours, and then I gave myself a 10-minute break, and then I worked for another two hours, and then I gave myself an hour break, and I went down to the bodega and got a sandwich and sat there and wrote a review. Um, and then for the writing part, I actually never write fiction in my house, oh. ever. I write outside, I go to parks, I go to cafes, I go to hotels, anywhere else, because my brain is so stuck in like my house is where I record that I, I have no creativity there for fiction. So I found that that getting literally getting out of the house is how I get shit done for everything else. That's where I answer. Any, I don't answer interview questions at my house. I don't do any, all. It's only recording, and I found my brain just likes that habit and. You'll find what your habits are too, and you'll know the things that get you in the groove. But for me, that's I, I just have these very set things. I mean, the thing that sucks is when little things derail that, yeah. like the time that the power went out on a Monday, and I was like, oh, my oh. whole year is ruined, which is like not actually how it worked. But like for me, I, it freaked me out because I was like, but Monday is my day when I do this one thing. I don't have a Monday anymore. And I was like, time has like detached mm -hmm. from the meaning in my brain. And like, it really, I just shifted everything to Tuesday and Wednesday. And then I was like, well, I have a day off now. But I, it's, it's developing those routines that make you feel comfortable because I found that I can be in that creative space that way. That's brilliant. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I'm gonna commit a lot of that to memory. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm gonna go ahead and end here. Oh, cool. Um, go ahead and um, what's your website one more time, even though most people already cool. know it. <laughs> you can find me as Mark Does Stuff on everything Mark, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. MarkDoesStuff.com is where all of my Mark Reads and Mark Watch or my Mark Watches videos are. Uh, MarkWatches.net, MarkReads.net, those are the TV and book sites. Um, and I don't think there's anything else. Oh, my author page is MarkOshiro.com. Um, I'm all over the internet. I own half the internet. I'm just kidding. I don't at all. Um, yeah, it'd be but it's awesome very, if you it's, did. I know it would be awesome. Give me some of that Bezos money. It'd be great. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm very easy to find on, on the internet. And you can find William at allaboutwilliam.com. I'm Toden. You can find me at Toden.com, and you can find all my links through there. Also, medialitersandwich.com. And I'm on a new podcast. Uh, we will be officially being syndicated on DD Radio uh, coming probably next month. And part of that is I was kind of roped in to be a host on Disgruntled Discussions. So you can check them out, Disgruntled Discussions, and check out their fuller uh, Facebook page. Uh, disgruntled veterans and of course just check out uh, dv radio and dysfunctional veterans uh there's such a it's a whole new world it's a totally different world especially if you're a veteran uh it, they do a lot of amazing things and a lot of hilarious things um i wouldn't check out their facebook groups if you get offended easily that's just a tip uh <laughs> thank you for watching thank you for listening i hope you enjoyed our discussion thank you for coming on thank you this was podcast. a blast that felt like it lasted five minutes, by the way. I can't believe it. 40, 40 minutes went by like that. I'm saying the same thing. That's amazing. Right. Bravo. Yeah. Thank you. It may the algorithms be in your favor. <laughs> I love that ending. May the algorithms, because really, that's, we're all ruled by algorithms forever.